Welcome to J310. You'll notice there's a camera up in the back that's recording me. It's part of a new reality show we're doing. Uh, MTV has picked me up for another season. No, it's not, that's not what it's for at all. Just uh, recording lectures for a future version of this class. So ignore the camera. It uh, shouldn't intrude too much. All right, here's what we're going to do today. In most classes, the first day of class is a review of the syllabus. Uh, a boring middle-aged guy who looks, you know, kind of like me, stands up and reads to you a syllabus, which you're perfectly capable of reading yourself. So we're not going to do that on the assumption that you all, in fact, can read. The syllabus is on Blackboard. It's been up for about a week. And what I would prefer to do, rather than review it on the first day, is put that off until the second class day. We'll do that on Thursday. So we will come in on Thursday, and I will hit the highlights of the course, the requirements, the exams, so that everybody understands what we're doing here. But rather than immediately put you to sleep, right, there's nothing quite as boring as having a syllabus read to you. So, of course, this is UT, so eventually I will put you to sleep, right? Large lecture class, 8 a.m. At some point, all of you will sleep during this class. It's okay. Right? Just don't worry about it. It's way too early. But on the first day, let's take a different course here. Let's talk a bit about how we're going to approach this class. And in the course of doing that, I think we'll be talking about what the class is about. So today, rather than review the details of the class, I want to talk more about the idea behind the class. I'm going to do that to a large degree by, about, by talking about myself. Uh, not, I hope, in a self-indulgent fashion, but in a political fashion. Immediately in this class, we're going to start talking about politics, because you can't talk about journalism without talking about politics. Because if journalism is of any value, it's of value to our political lives, and there is a politics to it, and we need to figure that out. So to introduce that idea, I'm going to talk not immediately about the politics of journalism, but about the politics of teaching in a modern American university. I'm going to talk about how I approach this class. And in doing so, I think signal some of the key issues we're going to talk about throughout the semester in the context of journalism, its role in a democratic society. So that's the agenda for today. We'll quit a bit early to give people who have questions about registration or other technical matters time to come down and deal with that. But I do want to go immediately into what I think is the core of the course, trying to figure out politics. So how do I approach the act of university teaching? I'm going to suggest there are really three ways to go about thinking through the politics of teaching. I'm going to tell you the approach I prefer. I'm going to call those three ways to think about the politics of teaching. Number one, an illusory neutrality. Number two, an aggressive advocacy. Or number three, an open and honest engagement. Three possible ways to approach teaching. Now, most of you have been at this university a while, or perhaps transferred from other universities, so you've already had some exposure to the university classroom, some exposure to other professors. And already, you may see where I'm going with that list of three possible ways to approach university teaching. Illusory neutrality, aggressive advocacy, or open and honest engagement. You can also tell by the way I've labeled these three which one I'm going to come down on the side of, yes? Not too hard to figure out where I'm heading with this. So let's talk about what I mean by these terms. Illusory, illusory neutrality. Neutrality that I'm going to argue is an, an illusion. 
When people who teach, especially in the humanities and the social sciences, history, philosophy, political science, sociology, literature, the folks who teach in that realm sometimes assert that they are going to be neutral in the classroom. Perhaps you've heard a professor say this. They'll announce at the beginning of the class that they, of course, have political ideas, political positions, political commitments of their own but they tell you that they're going to be neutral. Yes? Anybody ever had a professor say that? I, I have my own positions, of course, but I'm going to remain neutral for the whole class. Okay? You've heard that. When somebody says that, how many of you believe them? <laughs> no, no, you shouldn't believe them. Because it's an illusion. To claim neutrality in political matters, I'm going to argue, is illusory. Can't be done that when we step in front of a classroom to teach, we are bringing a political orientation to that class. Mm -hmm. Now, if one accepts that there is no neutrality possible, you could say, well, then the, the position one should strike is one of aggressive advocacy. If nobody's neutral, you might as well come in and argue for your position. And occasionally you will see professors who do that. They may, they may not announce they're going to do that, but sometimes they do. They slip into an advocacy, sometimes even a very aggressive advocacy. But I'm going to argue that's not the appropriate position of a professor as well. That this is not a pulpit, this is not a political platform. This is not a place for me to try to convince you that the way I think is correct. Now, I'm confident that the way I think is correct, and I know that the brighter of you will eventually come to that conclusion yourself. So I don't need to be too aggressive, no. Now, the goal here is to open up space for you to come to your own conclusions. And advocacy that is too aggressive is going to impede that process, so I don't believe that's appropriate either. Instead, I'm going to argue that someone in my position, a professor in front of a class, should be open and honest in engaging his or her political positions. I should make it clear where I come from, not to try to proselytize so that you accept that position, but to make clear the assumptions that are behind this class and behind the things I say. And I think being open and honest about that is the appropriate stance. It gives you the capacity to then scrutinize what I'm saying. There's no concern about me trying to slip something in on you. It's right out in the open. Now, the way I would summarize this is that there is a politics to teaching but teaching is more than politics. If I were to reduce my teaching philosophy to one sentence, that would be it. There's a politics to teaching, but teaching is more than politics. When, when those of us who teach, again, in the humanities, the social sciences, those disciplines that are primarily concerned with human affairs, the whole different set of questions if you're in mathematics or the sciences, but when we're teaching about human communities. There is always a politics to that teaching, but teaching is more than politics. What do I mean by that? There's always a politics to teaching. When I come up with the idea for a class, the ideas that help me construct that class reflect my own political understandings. How could it be otherwise? When I select textbooks for you to read, those textbooks reflect my political understanding. How could it be otherwise? When I put together lectures, choose which topics to speak about, which to ignore, that reflects a politics, reflects my political understanding of the world. I don't think it could be otherwise. There is always a politics to teaching because teaching, like life, is about choices endless choices. Every moment one is teaching, one is making choices. 
whether to go in that direction or this direction, whether to emphasize that topic or this topic, whether to highlight the writing of this person or that person. All of those are choices that reflect a politics. So teaching is always political. There's always something about the choices I make to, in teaching that are going to reflect my politics, my understanding of the world. Okay. But teaching is more than politics. Teaching is more than me trying to construct that picture of the world and simply delivering it to you with the assumption that you should accept it yourself. That's not really teaching. That's propaganda. So there's a politics to teaching, but teaching is more than politics. If this were not a classroom, if this were a political meeting, and I were trying to persuade all of you to accept a political position of mine because I want that political position to triumph, I want it to become law, let's say. Well, in that case, I'm trying to persuade you. I'm trying to bring you to my position. And one would hope we do that honestly, but we do it with the clear intent to persuade, to shift your position from where you are to where I am. That is not the goal in the classroom. The goal in the classroom is to challenge what you believe, force you to rethink what you believe, and in the end, even if you remain in a position different than mine, you are, you are more c convinced of your own position. That's the goal in teaching. So I'm going to speak often about politics in this class, and in certain settings I will even tell you what my political position might be, not toward the goal of proselytizing, but toward the goal of making more clear the process by which I got there so that you can evaluate that position and come to decide for yourself what your position might be. So, the first point I want to make is about the inevitably political nature of what we're doing here. If you walk out the door at the end of the semester and tell your friends, you know that Jensen, he's just political. I'll say, yes, good, you, you figured it out, good, that's a good thing. <laughs> Not going to apologize for that. Okay. Now, in the course of talking about politics, as I said, there are good and bad ways of going about that. The good way is challenging, creating a space for critical thinking, inviting you to evaluate your own ideas. The bad way is proselytizing, preaching, trying to impose a position on you. Okay. But we have to be careful in evaluating because it's my observation that when people reproduce the conventional wisdom of a culture, when somebody stands up and says political things that are in line with the dominant point of view in the culture, that can be political, but it's often not seen as political because it simply reflects what everybody assumes to be the common sense understanding of the culture. So often people say things that are very political, but they don't appear to be political because they reflect that conventional wisdom. But if someone makes a comment that challenges the conventional wisdom, then that seems politicized. So in the context of a classroom, if you have a professor standing up and offering political opinions, but political opinions that are in line with the conventional wisdom, that professor is not going to seem to be engaging in political discussion in class. But if that professor gets up and challenges the conventional wisdom, then people are going to say, well, that professor is politicizing the classroom. And the argument I want to make is that both of those things have a, both of those positions have a politics. Let me give you an example. Okay. The University of Texas, as many of you know, has an intercollegiate football team. Are you familiar with this? They're called the Longhorns. And, and unfortunately, you know, they fell on hard times this fall, but they regularly compete at the national level. Right? So, UT football. And often in the fall, there is a football game on Saturday, correct? Right. Now, if on the, the class before a, a football weekend, 
I were to stand up in class and say, listen, many of you know there is a football game this weekend, and I hope that you will boycott this football game, because intercollegiate football played at the level of these large schools is a cancer upon the intellectual integrity of the university. Everyone understands this. Football undermines the intellectual integrity of the university. There are huge amounts of money spent on this game. Often that money is spent in ways that diverts needed resources from the educational mission of the university. After all, we have a football coach who's paid, excuse me, this is hard for me to, the football coach at the, I can do this, the football coach at the University of Texas at Austin is paid $5.1 million! They pay a man $5.1 million to coach a children's game. And when you put those kind of resources into that, you undermine the integrity of the institution. There's a whole infrastructure to serve athletics, to serve the drunken alumni who come to games in the hopes that those drunken alumni will give some of their money to the university. The whole thing is rotten to the core, right? And if you have any self-respect, you'll boycott that football game. You'll refuse to go sit in that stadium, you know, like some sheep in some sort of crypto-fascist, Nazi-like sign. You ever notice that? Zig Heil! I mean, it's like, yeah, geez, it's sick! It's depraved! And if you have any self-respect, if you believe in the possibility of higher education, the possibility of democracy, the possibility of human decency at all, you'll boycott that goddamn football game, right? Absolutely. Now, if I stood up and gave you that speech, many people would say, well, that's inappropriate, yeah? That's politicizing the classroom. Okay, Jensen's got an opinion about football. He's got an opinion about the salary of Matt Brown. You'll find a lot of faculty have the same opinion about the salary of Matt Brown. But, okay, I would be seen as politicizing the classroom, yes? And some of you might be quite offended. You might complain. You might write a letter to the dean. Right? Now, that's, there's a politics to that speech I just gave, yes? Undoubtedly. Okay, now, imagine I got up before the class, on the class period before a football weekend, and said, everybody, big game this week, have a great time. Okay, and that was it. Game this weekend, have a great time. Go out, enjoy yourselves. Right? Those of you who are of legal drinking age, feel free to engage in the tailgating activities that often lead to intoxication and projectile vomiting, if that's your thing. And those of you who are not of legal age, I can hook you up with a guy who does fake IDs, just see me after class, whatever. Okay, so if I stand up and I say, you know, game this weekend, have a great time, is anybody going to leave the classroom saying, did you see Jensen politicizing the classroom? He was endorsing the football program. My God, can you, do you, let's go write a letter to the dean complaining. Would anybody do that? No, most people would shrug, because on this campus, you know, borderline psychotic support for a children's game is considered normal. I don't know why, but it is. 80,000 people getting in a stand, into, a, into the stands, half of them on the verge of projectile vomiting, in Nazi-like crypto-fascist salutes. That scene is normal. And if you say, Go engage in that activity. Nobody's going to accuse you of politicizing. But my point, I think, is, is obvious. Both of those speeches would have a politics underneath them, correct? Both of them are asserting a political position in relationship to the role of inter intercollegiate athletics, specifically the football program, on this campus. Both of them are making an argument, in a sense. The first one, because it's making an argument that goes against the grain of the conventional wisdom, would be seen as politicizing the classroom, and I might come under some scrutiny for having made that speech. The second speech would be in line with the conventional wisdom of the campus, and I can guarantee you there would be virtually no reaction. Maybe some, you know, disaffected student in the back would grumble, 
I'm so sick of this football talk or something. But that's about the extent of it. Right? Both are political. Both politicize the classroom in a certain sense. One is going to be marked. The other one is going to go by unchallenged. That's what I mean when I say teaching is always political, but it's more than just politics. There's always a politics to the conversation we will have in this classroom. And pretending that I am neutral is a con. Whenever faculty stand up and say, I'm going to be neutral in this class, what they're really saying is, I don't think you're very smart. Hi, I'm going to be neutral. And you look just dumb enough to accept that. So good, very good. I'm on good, safe ground with this one. He doesn't look very bright. That's what they're saying to you. Now, maybe they actually believe it. I think some faculty who say, I'm going to be neutral, actually believe it, because they've been trained to believe that themselves. But it's an absurd claim. When you think about the, the choices that go into constructing a classroom, selecting text, and shaping the conversation in the classroom, there will always be political choices made. The question is, can you defend the political choices? That's the real question. Are the choices that lead me to construct this class in a certain fashion, assign the textbooks I assign, and raise the issues that I raise in class, can I defend the process by which I came to those decisions? That's the real question. And to do that, you have to be aware of that process. You have to know why we're here and why I constructed this the way I did. In the first section of this course, when we deal with the question of democracy, I'll give you another example, we're going to spend one day talking about the relationship of the economic system to the political system. We're going to talk about the relationship of capitalism to democracy. We're going to ask a fundamental question. Are capitalism and democracy compatible? That's a very politicized question. To raise that question is to put on the table a challenge. And that's a political decision that I've made based on my own study of the subject and my own political orientation. To raise that question is political, but to not raise it is political. If we went through the entire segment of this course on democracy and I never once spoke about the relationship of the economic to the political, the relationship between capitalism and democracy. If I never spoke about that, that would be a political decision too. But that would probably go by unnoticed because often we talk about political and economic as if they're in separate spheres. Right? You study economics in the economics department. You study politics in the government department. They're separate. Bringing them together is to make a political point, to suggest that it's a worthy subject. To ignore that is also to make a political point. 